Steven. Hello. We're live. We're live. We're on stream. Welcome back. Another week, another stream, another very exciting, interesting discussion we're going to have. Yeah, this is going to be fun. This one's going to be all about robotics and what 3D printing, especially high volume 3D printing, can do for robotics, um, all the way from robotics competitions and uh, like kind of hobbyist level robotics all the way to industrial robotics and, and automation on a mass scale. So yeah, buckle up. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a pretty interesting one. Um, and yeah, we've got, I know we've got a lot of people who participate in FTC in the chat. So um, we'll be keeping an eye on it. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to throw them in and we'll, yeah, we'll respond. Um, this is definitely going to be a very interactive stream given our current audience. And I guess without further ado, we should kind of introduce ourselves and our special guest. Yeah. So I'm Mateo. I'm one, the co-founder of 3DQ Systems. Um, and I'm joined by Steven. Yep. Yeah, I'm the product lead for Quinley. And we have a very special guest today. Uh, Shahed. Hello. Shahed Chala. Say hi, Shahed. Well, introduce oh, yourself. Oh, nice to meet you all. Shahed, why don't you tell everyone what you do and, and why we have you on for this uh, robotic stream specifically? Yeah, so uh, I'm a second year mechatronics engineering student at the University of Waterloo, and I'm currently a hardware intern at 3DQ. And the reason I'm on this stream is because mechatronics engineering is the field of computer controlled mechanical systems or robots. Uh, and so I have a really deep interest in robotics and also in 3D printing. So this stream is very much interesting for me and I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and if, if you guys were here last week, um, Shahed has been working on the design for the Quinley for All to make her. Um, she's been adapting Richard's design and, and putting the final touches on it. And I guess that's a little bit of like 3DQ's started to dip in a tiny bit into robotics with that kind of thing in motion systems. So, yeah. I mean, even, even, even we have even now firsthand experience of 3D printing being used for stuff like that. So it's, it's yeah, it's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, so Shahed, why don't you give us an intro to what robotics competitions really are? Sure. So throughout high school, I competed in what's called the first competition. That stands for the Inspiration and Recreation of Science and Technology. And it's basically a robotic competition where teams of students that have the support of teachers and mentors from the community have around two months, depending on the game, to build a robot together. And then they use it to compete with other teams in their area. There are divisional competitions, there are provincial competitions, and then other international and world competitions, as well as several off-season ones hosted by other teams. And what this really does is it gives an opportunity for students to apply robotics and STEM concepts while they are in high school. And FIRST Robotics is actually spans a lot of ages, so it, it encompasses any, anyone from preschool to the end of high school, depending on what division you're in. So FLL Junior, the youngest age division, followed by FLL, which is first Lego League, FTC, which is the first tech challenge, and FRC, which is the first robotics competition. And FRC typically has the largest robots um, that, that are, are built by teams. And it's very interesting to see how the, ch the game changes every year and how students bring their creativity in to really innovate robots every single season. So these competitions, what, what, is the, what is the point of these competitions? Why are students from you know, across the continent coming together to, to build these robots? Right, so this is oftentimes in school, you know, you'll, you'll go to class, you'll go to math, you'll go to science, and you'll learn about these concepts and you might have projects in class but it, it's never going to compare to a real world example and first robotics allows students to have that real industry 
to level opportunity to apply their STEM skills and develop robots. And a lot of them have even been moving into 3D printing some of their parts like you see in the pictures here. And you know, we're talking not just a few teams um, in Canada and the US, but around over 90,000 teams internationally compete at these competitions every single year. Um, so the level of creativity just increases. Yeah, some of the competitions are, are massive, frankly. Yeah, and the challenges they have too are pretty, pretty intense. Yeah. Did you probably learn quite a bit during these, like doing the whole development process? Like, what do you think, like some, some key skills people will develop if they join a, a robotics team? Yeah, I mean, usually students learn how to wire electrical systems, build mechanisms, CAD, and program in university. But these are skills that I've picked up, you know, starting at the end of elementary school and all throughout high school. Um, so to, to have the ability to pad up 100 component assemblies while, you know, still in grade 10 is something that the typical high schooler doesn't get to experience. Yeah, that probably gives you a bit of a head start coming into university. <laughs> a little bit. I haven't touched like a proper CAD assembly until my second year, so. Oh, you really gotta catch nice. up to these guys. Yeah, no, it would have been nice to be in a, a robotics team. I would have joined that. Yeah. It wasn't that fun. Yeah, and I like I like the idea of the challenges. So the, these robots operate autonomously, right? During during the challenge, or, or are they remote controlled? There's actually two periods to a competition. So matches are approximately two and a half minutes um, in FTC and FRC. And what teams will do is for the first 30 seconds of the match, the robot is running completely autonomously using the sensors and programming that the students have built. And then for the remainder of the match, um, they're teleoperating the robot. They're controlling it from their controls. And a lot of teams will actually create semi-autonomous programs for their robots based on field markers um, or camera vision. And that will just make the robot more precise and better suited to pick up all of these game pieces and score. Yeah, I can imagine like, you would probably not want to you know, remote control a mechanism that picks up a cube, but you might want to have an automated routine for if your robot, you know, runs over a cube, what does it do with it? Does it like how it picks it up and stuff like that? Yeah, I think with smart programming and good design, your robot is just going to be better than a human operator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're all about automation here. So this, this, these competitions are super fascinating. And I think it's a, like as we go through our discussion, we're going to see the first robotics is kind of a, a microcosm of, of how robotics and robotics automation can be applied um, in industry for, for various specific tasks. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about the first robotics challenges, at least from what I understand, is um, your, your robots have to be pretty generalized. Like there is a a general goal, but there's so many different ways of how you can achieve that goal that you'll see a bunch of different designs as well. Yeah, well, that's what happens with like huge open ended design problems. Is well, like, like a well formulated design problem has many solutions, maybe infinite solutions. Yeah, and <laughs> that's true. There might not even be a best solution there, you know, so you have to get creative. Um, I guess one, one question I have, Chad, is for what what would you say gives a team the best competitive advantage when designing a robot? Is it um, access to tools, access to design programs, uh, the ability to iterate, the ability to fabricate their own parts, or like what 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 really helps? Um, yeah, make a good final robot before it goes into competition. And I, I'd actually be curious to know from chat as well. Um, what they think. Yeah, so from my experience in the years that I've done FRC and now I'm mentoring an FTC team, it really comes down to the experiences that you've had as a team uh, in learning to develop your technical skills. You know, so learning mechanism design, learning efficient ways to make components and learning how to fabricate things that will last. Um, because as you can imagine, these robots are doing very repetitive tasks every single match throughout the whole season. Um, and really that that ties nicely into ability to attain use of technology.
technology. Uh, so teens are usually limited by their ability to access things like CNC machines um, or water jet cutters, 3D printing. And really a, a teen's creativity uh, through, a, through using CAD um, is, um, is, is unbound really because SOLIDWORKS has licenses for first team that they can use for free and things like other software programs like Fusion 360 are available. So it really does come down to the technology available for producing these companies. So why don't we, here Dominic says, the faster you can build something, the faster you can make a better part when it breaks. That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, I guess that how you were mentioning the, the ability, the experience to know what to fabricate. And then I think there's probably a lot of um, learning through failure and a lot of trial and error that you have to go through. because. It, Oftentimes, you're designing completely unique systems for this specific mm -hmm. challenge. Um, for sure. And in, in the first year of Teams, you know, it, it's a struggle to complete one robot. Mm -hmm. But I know Teams with lots of experience will build two or three um, within the same time because it, that experience just carries over through the years. So I guess speaking of uh, creative design, why don't we show off the um, some creative design with... <laughs> Ignite Robotics. Um, uh, here, let me switch the slide over. So, so what are we looking at here, Shahad? Is this the, okay, here it is. Yeah, so this is a shooter hood that one of our sponsored teams, Ignite Robotics, has created. And essentially this mechanism is used during competition to take a, a ball game piece and shoot it into a bowl. And the purpose of having something like an adjustable hood where you see those black fingers coming up is to allow for the projection to be fine-tuned before the ball is actually shot. Because you can imagine with only two and a half minutes in a match, you don't have very much time to align your robot. So what they have is, you know, their vision system will orientate their robot and will determine how far this hood needs to be and what they actually did was they 3d printed all of the pieces so you can see these gray fingers that they've designed to have slots in them and they alternate uh with a, a sort of like a linear gear that's copied onto the, the yeah, profile on the of these outside. parts yeah and they use gears on the back to bring the fingers open and closed um while constrained by these slots and that's driven by a motor and timing belt and they use an encoder to track the position and a switch at the bottom to zero it out uh, throughout the gameplay. And it's, it's really interesting how they decided to 3D print this. Um, oftentimes teams would use things like metal fabrication to print a part like this, but that would be super heavy. And especially for their application where they don't require it to be heavy, but they just need it to guide the ball using a lighter weight, using lighter weight plastic through 3D printing fabrication was a really good choice. I could imagine, yeah. Well, this is a very complicated part in general, having like a curved gear profile yeah. on there. And, and, and I'm, I'm guessing it probably took quite a set of iterations to actually create something that would function smoothly too, because it's, it's not very, the design itself is not linear. It's very complicated and you'd have to account for a lot of strange forces going in strange directions. So I think this is, I think you're right, this, this is a really excellent application of 3D printing because if you need to change a slight angle, you're not going back to the machine shop for a day, you're just mm -hmm. changing your CAD and, and printing it out in a matter of hours. Well, I also like the, the, like the creativity of this design. Like if you were limited to CNC or water jetting, you'd probably get a more like a simplistic design. Um, which might still work, but then you can't really iterate it properly and maybe it won't be as as good as like a fully 3D printed um, like curved linear gear like this. Yeah, imagine if you had to change the profile of the curve. Yeah, and then... You'd have to remachine the entire thing. thing. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, this part is just generally very impressive. I, I thought it was a great example of, of the use of 3D printing. And so in 3D printing is generally used 
quite a lot for FIRST Robotics, right? It is, yes. We're coming more increasingly these of FDM printers are becoming affordable and students are purchasing them themselves uh, to play with and with schools even buying 3D printers. So what, what kind of materials are usually used for, for these types of applications? Because I have an understanding of, of materials typically used in industry robotics and I would assume it's pretty similar for this. It is similar and it's, it's typically more the really well used filament. Things like PLA, um, ABS if a team has access to a really good printer and a consistent enough environment. And then teams with a lot of 3D printing experience and the budget to do so will print with a lot of carbon fiber and forced filament. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you guys use um, like TPU for any flexible compliant mechanisms? Probably. <laughs> it seems like something that I would, I would at least consider if, if building robots. Yeah, TPU as well. Because traditionally robots have been very rigid and, you know, very like locked in place kind of thing. But now with flexible materials, that could uh, open up some new, new possibilities. One of the really, um, I think, big benefits of incorporating and designing around 3D printed parts is that in case they break, you can get one really, really quickly. And, and we have a photo of, of, a, of a pulley that you can see kind of on the, on the left side here completely got snapped and shredded and it's like held in place with a zip tie now, completely cracked. Um, and since it's 3D printed, I guess you can just print another one rather than having to order one from a, a milling site from, you know, far away. Yeah, or if you didn't have any more in stock, because I know some teams buy kind of bulk gears just to have a, like an inventory of them. Yeah, before we were, we were discussing about how a lot of teams are kind of pushed into um, buying standard parts for everything, um, just both due to cost, but also due to replaceability. Um, yeah, maybe Chad, if you have, if you know a bit more about that, I, I thought that was a pretty salient point because it restricts the design creativity that you have over your robot, right? For sure. I mean, I can speak from experience. Uh, in my shop in high school, we had a drawer of twenty of the same exact sprocket, <laughs> just because we know we knew that they were good enough and we would design around them. Whereas when teams design parts specifically for the task itself, um, the doors to creativity are, are much more open and you can create far more unique and efficient designs really. Um, and, and teams are really utilizing this to their advantage like we saw with the Ignite shooter hood and these pulleys and you know a lot of even brackets to place the extrusion in specific positions. Uh, allow teams to really speed up their prototyping process, but also enable them to build robots that are more intuitive for the team. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually a very interesting restriction. And it's something that happens in general robotics as well. You see this um, idea of modularization of robotics components. Like there's, there are companies uh, like Universal Robotics or like Fanuc who have their standard line of robotics arms and no matter what application they're in, they all look the same because it's very difficult yeah. to customize for an application. So it's, it's, it's almost at odds that you're forced to um, purchase a standard inventory of parts, but yet you have such open-ended design challenges that require unique solutions. And I, I bet a lot of time and efficiency is lost in trying to fit those parts to the solution rather than coming up with completely customized parts. Mm -hmm. And weeks of wait time for waiting for right. parts to ship, especially when you've got 10,000 teams trying to order the same extrusion or the same exact, uh, you know, like compliance meals because they know that that's the easiest intake mechanism to have. So you end up having, you know, Sites like Animark and Vex completely sold out of all of the standardized components. 
there's some there's some pretty interesting comments that came up while we were talking. Um, Armin said, "This is especially important for FTC teams because most of them don't have machine shops." What what would you say like? What does a typical FTC team have access to uh, in terms of fabrication services? So most FTC teams, because uh, they're in the grade six to nine range, um, their schools wouldn't probably have a machine shop. They're in middle school. That's very much a more high school thing. And even then, um, older high schools will tend to have machine shops, none of the newer ones. So teams end up really relying on their sponsors. And when you can't find enough sponsors, you're in a bind. Um, so you're really forced to use these standardized components. And I, I've seen more and more now FTC teams investing in 3D printers because that it's a much more affordable way to get the design, to get the design freedom that they're looking for. And FRC teams, because they're much larger, um, will typically have access to more sponsors and potentially a machine shop in their school, though it still is difficult for a lot of teams when they're starting out if they don't have those resources available right away. Yeah, and machine shops are expensive to maintain and keep operate. Stock. Yeah. If you break an end mill or something and there's a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like with a three D printer you get a lot less uh, a lot less startup costs and a lot less operating costs. Yeah, machine shops are also really unsafe. You have to have a few teachers supervising students as they're machining parts, whereas with three D printing, you're you're inputting the G code file and you can walk away. Mm -hmm. And even if students go to to take parts, they're not they're not facing those very significant safety concerns. Carla was saying that um, they had built a prototype, and eighty percent of it had been three D printed. And it was at that point that they realized they, they really couldn't have done the design that they were doing without 3D printing, which I think is, is, is just a testament to how 3D printing allows you to come up with such unique design choices that, that, you're, um, lo that you'd otherwise be locked out of if you had to use standard parts or use CNC machining, um, just because CNC is really, really... Un inaccessible and going back to industry robotics that's why you see um, I think one of the one of the biggest problems in industrial automation like with robot arms is is the fact that you have all these very slightly different purposes um, that these arms are being applied in but because you have a standard arm and the only really customizable part is the effector that you know manipulates your product um, you have to dedicate a lot of space to these machines and you have to make sure that your product works with a pre-built effector. Otherwise, you're investing thousands and thousands of dollars of, of um, custom design work that has to be done to, to create something for your particular factory. So you'll even see in industrial applications, um, like for, for, for box sorting, for example, there will be a standard method of moving boxes and your your boxes have to be compliant to the robotic arm. It's almost like you're you're kicking the problem down the road um, with 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 that type of automation. And where we've really been seeing 3D printing shine is is in the in the first robotics, it's it's the ability to come up with these creative and unique design solutions. And you see that in industry as well. Um, my dad was doing a project for automating the transfer of, of donuts between two conveyor belts that move different speeds. And they had used like a typical Delta robot arm mm -hmm. um, with a stock effector. And he, he got it working just fine, but the uh, stock effector like was not designed with that application in mind. And so, it's a little bit more bulky than it needs to be, and it limits the speed of the arm as well. And I think yeah. that's something we'll we'll talk about too: um, is speed and weight. But where I was getting to that is, we ended up trying to three D print one, uh, an effector that was specifically shaped to the type of donut 
Did it like go through the hole and then kind of? <laughs> no, it was, it they out? were long johns, but it was like a, a exactly shaped to how the dough was cut. Okay. And so you would have like a, a specific purpose effector that was just one of one made for this one factory and how they mm -hmm. cut their donuts. And um, just having the freedom to do that at a super low cost is, is I think, yeah, I think it's, it's a really great demonstration of 3D printing. Yeah, well, because you wouldn't use a custom end effector for anything. Like, because it would just cost too much money to get to get machined. It would just be a fully custom thing. Yeah, you'll even see in a lot of factories, um, the materials get like pre-positioned and prepared to go into the robotic arm section. Right. Which you don't really want to do. That's like in a completely additional cost and facility that most people don't think of when they're implementing this kind of automation in their factories. Right, so you're kind of just preparing your products for, or like, yeah, you're preparing your products to be automated. Rather yeah. Than preparing the automation to deal with your product. Yeah, exactly. And then it ends up taking up more space, it costs more, and, and it, it changes the flow of how, how your things work. And obviously that happens to varying degrees, but um, you'll see like, in a car factory, for example, there are very, very purpose-built uh, robotic components for very, very specific tasks. Mm -hmm. And the only way they were able to even create such specific solutions is because they have the advantage of a massive scale and they can afford you know, a million dollar robotic system that's custom tailored. Whereas with something like the first competitions, <laughs> I don't think any first team has a budget of, of millions of dollars, but they're facing similar unique challenges and they have to come up with unique design solutions for them. Yeah, so in a way that's even more impressive than like those mega factories. Because you're limited, oh, yeah. by, limited by a lot more like a low budget. We have a lot more chat. Yeah, I'm just scrolling through the chat to make sure we to see if there's some interesting points. We a lot of talk about pet G versus other materials. Yeah. Yeah, material choice is something you also get with 3D printing because mm -hmm. the same machine can print a wide a range of materials. Yeah, well, it's good to even just be aware. Um, for example, like PETG is better at resisting impacts, for example, but it, it isn't as rigid as PLA, actually. PLA is quite quite rigid, but it's more brittle, so there's, there's trade-offs with everything. So in terms of these robotics competitions, what... Um, I guess, what is the standard mentality when it comes to approaching these uh, designs? We, we already talked about um, a lot of teams keep an inventory of standard parts and reuse parts from previous competitions because of sourcing issues, but also because once you have something that works, you kind of want to stick to it. Um, how about, like, how, how prevalent would you say 3D printing is in uh in like current first robotics design yeah so i think it's it's being increasingly used both for prototyping and and part production for these robots so a season would look something like the game is released and you get the rule book it's 100 pages but say your team spends a couple of days reading through everything and figuring out you know what's even going on You've got some university students who are building shabby versions of the robot they think could be applicable for the competition um, in the first couple of days just for fun. And then you really start focusing on what your mechanisms are looking like. Uh, teams in the past would use things like cardboard to try to, you know, outline what their mechanisms might look like. They might build a little sticker out of cardboard to see what the reach would be. Um, and as you can imagine, it's a very imprecise way to prototype a mechanism that, that is, has to be tailored to such a specific task. So teams now are utilizing 3D printing to create general prototyping parts uh, in the beginning, you know, first few days of competition for the first week. And then they're really trying to now quickly design parts and mechanisms to put into you know, production if they have those that need to put into 3D printing so that they can build the mechanism and reiterate the design a few times. 
And as you can imagine, they need to leave some time at the end to actually practice with their robot. And in parallel with all of this at Qinghan, a lot of other things that you know are going on, like sponsorship relations and marketing and trying to video the whole process and writing awards papers. Um, so those teams that are taking full advantage of 3D printing are able to prototype a lot more efficiently and are able to produce their, their first prototypes of their mechanisms faster. And hence, they have more time to iterate those mechanisms and really fine tune them to get more practice time at the end with better quality mechanisms, rather than you know waiting in between competitions to redesign and try to refactor whatever they plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's good to point out that a lot of people that do these competitions have a, other things in their life as well to, to take care of, like school. And time is probably quite limited, I would imagine. So the less time you can spend fiddling around with, um, you know, multiple iterations on a slow CNC or something, uh, like every minute you save is probably going to lead to a lot better mental state. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's where. So we should mention that we've we've started sending out Quinley kits to um, some teams, and I, I think that that's how we'll we'll start seeing them save time and, and have much more design flexibility because um, when we were talking before you were saying how generally there's one or two people that will run the 3D printer and like you said they're still in school so they they don't have all day to run the machine and with something like Quinley if, if you can set that up on a machine as long as it, the design is verified before you print um, you can just th those those operators can queue up all the parts um, have the printers do all the work for them, and so they, they typically the more senior members of the team can focus their expertise and experience on on other aspects of the design, rather than just um, rather than just running the three uh, D printers all day. No, you're definitely on the dot with that, and it also enabled a lot of the other students. Um, especially the younger ones who are just joining the team and learning about 3D printing to practice their design skills in a way that won't impede on any of the other functions that the team needs to get done. Um, the students could, you know, from home even, send their files and add them to the queue using the Quinley software and produce all of those parts and then come the next day in school in the morning and have them ready to look at or, or be tested or combined into a mechanism. Um, so the lead times are shortened so much that it, it really gives teams more peace of mind during the design process, knowing that they're not constantly waiting on a certain person to pick up a part from the printer or having to start and stop uh, files as much as they can. I remember in high school, I'd have to go in between classes to give files to oh my, <laughs> my teacher. And they'd get a call you know, halfway through a physics test, Chad, come down. We, we need the next part to queue up on uh Oh my god. That yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah. With Quinley, that, that really does get saved. Yeah, I can't imagine how stressful that would be. Well, I can. I've <laughs> <laughs> I can, because I was 3D printing a lot while I was in high school. And yeah, it was very stressful, especially, at least in my case, I was, I was away from home. I, I didn't have a printer at my school. I was just running the one at my house. But it was the same thing. Oh, how how can I squeeze in uh, another cycle tonight before I have to go to sleep or before I have to leave for school or whatever? And yeah, it, it, it basically just takes over your life. And generally when it's the more experienced team members that have to run those machines, a lot of their time is being lost to just running the printers. Um, I think we should also talk about one of the initiatives you started uh, since you joined us, which is this idea of using 3D printing for on-site manufacturing for, for these competitions. Yeah, so we're, we're in talks with First Robot to potentially have an automated 3D printing center. So nothing has been decided just yet. Um, but the power to enable teams mid-competition to reprint parts that they need or to quickly redesign and really exercise their engineering prowess, as you say. Um, it, it's something really 
amazing. You know, you saw the pulley picture that we had from Ignite where they completely shredded their pulley in competition. And what they had to do was, you know, one person had the file, they had to print the part, and then, you know, late at night, someone has to drive that part to someone else's house because it's COVID now and the teams can't gather. And that person puts that part back in the robot, and someone else has to come get the robot and bring it back to the competition. And that, all of that could have been eliminated if at competition there was a service that would allow them to print out replacement parts. So all they would do is come in the next day, get the part from the center, and put it back on their robot. And so hopefully we're, we're going to work on providing that sort of thing, because it doesn't exist right now at first competition. They have access to a machine shop, but no 3D printers. And only the really experienced teams with uh, a lot of time and a lot of members can bring their own 3D printer to babysit during competition. Yeah, that's the thing. really exciting. I, I think the reason something like that hasn't been able to exist yet is, one, um, the labor requirement would just be far too high. You would need a lot of volunteers running the machines manually 24-7. And the other bit being that the, the demand is just too high regardless to do that. Like you'd either, you'd, you'd have to always balance out the demand with more people and more printers. And more printers, um, when you run them manually, always means more people. You double your printer, you double your labor requirement. Um, but yeah, now with, with a system like Quinly, with the automated queuing and the automated part removal, like you said, teams would be able to submit their designs to these centers and, and you could have pretty much a single operator who, who knows what they're doing, maybe one or two people running an entire bank of machines on site and just ensuring you know the, the parts are coming off well, that the designs being submitted are, are actually valid to be printable because... Yeah, that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I, I think it could be a real game changer um, and also just level the playing field a little bit for teams that don't have the resources to fly out 3D printers to remote competitions or, or drive to someone's house nearby in the middle of the night, right? I think this is going to be a better... Peace of mind, even. Mm -hmm. Because competition is already so stressful. Uh, replacing a part shouldn't be something that stresses you to add on top of that already. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like having a machine shop um, instead of a 3D print lab is almost like backwards. I would get the print lab and then a machine shop. Like, that seems... It seems like it would be um, just more generally useful because so many different parts can be 3D printed. Even if you have a part that's supposed to be a water jet cut, you could probably 3D print it, mm -hmm. and it would still probably work. Um, you know, it just helps having that design flexibility. Yeah, I think a lot of people would also be a fan of the fact that you could make design revisions during the competition if you yeah, wanted true. to. That's it. Like, oh, wait, <laughs> or if you see someone else's robot that's doing something kind of cool, you're like, that's such a bad idea. Yeah, that's a let's cool let's mechanism. Let's improve our robot in the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of, I will speak for myself, but I'd be a fan of being able to do last second revisions. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a lot of last second stuff that goes on in these competitions, if it's anything like oh, my experiences. <laughs> so I think, oh, go ahead, Chad. No, that's fine. I was going to transition to the next topic, um, which I can still do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so one of the other things that's first related, but also more generally, is the ability for 3D printing to provide um, lighter parts. Yeah. And this is imp very important in robotics, um, in industrial automation, because lighter parts means more speed. Um, but in the specific case of these robotics competitions, robots are battery powered and lighter parts means you, you use less power. Um, and so I, I know you had an anecdote about how a lot of teams like lose power partway through the competition and because you're, they're completely running off of batteries, right? Yeah, and there's some teams that have the capability to run 
pneumatic systems alongside their, you know, their battery powered mechanisms face this problem less. But with teams where the whole robot is powered by just a single battery, they're faced with making sure that that power lasts throughout the whole match. And even though it's just two and a half minutes, I've seen time and time again robots on the field that are you know, playing well and scoring really great, and then in the last 30 seconds, none of their mechanisms are aligning, all of their shots are off, um, their driving has slowed down. And that's because a lot of their components, especially their, their chassis base, is all made of metal. And those components really add weight and are super power intensive on mechanisms continue running for a long time. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you'll get better at you know, making lighter weight metal components, but it'll never be replacing all of your non-weight bearing components with something super lighter. Right. Yeah, and you get a lot more, um, like if you've seen sort of those optimized part topologies um, using that sort of generative design, you can get optimal parts um, that you can 3D print. You can't really CNC mill them unless you have a really complicated like five axis mill. Um, I, I think I think that's one of the the biggest misconceptions in 3D printing is everyone says, well, you can't use 3D printing because it'll never be as strong as other types of manufacturing. And I, that's correct technically on when you're comparing a part on a one to one basis. Mm -hmm. But the design complexity that you can achieve with 3D printing allows you to come up with creative ways of distributing forces so that you can create parts of equal strength or, or, or parts that are strong in the right places and to achieve the same goal. Yeah, um, like you see parts um, designed for CNC or like casting or something compared to 3D prints. And they're saying, okay, the 3D prints are worse, but if you have a part designed for additive versus a part designed for CNC, you'll probably find that the one designed for additive performs better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as generative design is a great example of that, just removing the need for material, but to achieve the same um, strength. But e even there's, there are things where you can do um, kind of metamaterial design, where you 3D print a complex structure. One of the most obvious examples is choosing a particular shape of infill or direction for your infill, but to achieve specific strength outcomes from your part, um, which you, you just can't do with CNC or injection molding because you get you know, a solid brick of material and that's kind of what you get. You'll yeah. have material where it doesn't need to be. And so with 3D printing, you can achieve equivalent parts but that are also far, far lighter. And I think when you compare it that way, um, in terms of a, a, a weight to strength ratio, you'll find that 3D printing wins out most of the time. Yeah, and you'll find actually with like FBM printing in, in particular, you get to have these closed cell infill structures versus um, sort of like the, the powder bed printing where you have to have openings so the powder can get out. So you actually get even lighter parts with FBM. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, you don't have to print. You don't have to print solid parts with FBM. Yeah. Um, or yeah, your, your design complexity goes way down because you can let the slicer do all the complicated infill patterns. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean that's got so much application. The like even going beyond robotics, if you could. 3D print some of the non-essential structural components in an electric car, your mass goes down and your battery life or your 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 driving distance is now improved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like replace I don't know some some cap that has to be solid because it's injection molded. Replace it with something that has you know 10% infill. It's not a structural part, so why not reduce the um, weight of that part and because with slicing that weight reduction is pretty much automated you could do it for all sorts of parts without even thinking about it and then for really large or critical parts you can have a designer or a generative design algorithm come up with with solutions of, of scaling the mass down for those but that 
goes back to lower power consumption, which is better for the environment, or <laughs> better for battery life or battery powered things. Uh, or on the flip side, it means faster speed, which is also very important, especially in, the, in terms of automation. You want your automation to run faster than humans. And any, any, as we've seen with our 3D printers, any slight improvement in your automation multiplies across time like immensely. If you save one minute on a part um, by slicing it differently with our 3D printers and you do a run of a thousand parts, you've now saved a thousand minutes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you see that with 3D printers, um, like the only thing really limiting speed on 3D printers is the laws of physics. Like your computer can read through a G-code file in, in a millisecond, um, but having to actually move the tool head in the right way, in an accurate way, um, it's like the one thing that limits, you know, the speed of 3D printing. Yeah. You have thermodynamics as well. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a good example of, of um, and it just lowers your cost in general. If you have to have less material supporting your robot or supporting whatever system you're constructing out of lighter parts, it, it's just less expensive to, to build. Yeah, well, you get fewer parts too, which makes it um, mm -hmm. like easier to build. And usually you can save on um, you know, additional complexity, less fewer fasteners, probably easier to assemble. I've seen some opposite ones where people make impossible to assemble 3D prints, but if you design it right, then it can really make things um, easier to work with. Yeah, I'll actually show off some 3D printed cutting tools um, made by Comet Group. And I think it's a really good example of, of something like this. These are, these are metal printed, obviously, but um, they're kind of application specific cutting tools and they're using metal additive manufacturing because machining that type of tool again specifically for certain applications will be way too expensive but with additive manufacturing we know our part cost is fixed whether you're making one or whether you're making a hundred thousand and they use that to their advantage to make these very specialized 3D printed cutting bits. Do you know what they're for? Do I know what they're for? I actually, yeah. well, for metal, I'm assuming. Cutting metal. <laughs> cutting metal. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm just curious, I've never seen a, an additive end mill. I guess there is the end mill. Yeah, but I think... They've got some weird, is it a left-handed thread on there or something? Let's <laughs> see, let's see. One thing I'm noticing is that it has yeah, holes in it. And I'm wondering if the part is actually hollow to some extent. Oh no, those might be holes for mounting the bits. Or it could be like a through hole coolant. Oh, that'd be cool. Some, that'd be so some, cool. Some end mills have coolant coming right through. Them. Right, and you could do you could cool. There was a there was a part. So we we've been experimenting with metal three D printing on Quinley, and there was a part that Shahed actually modeled for us, um, that was. A heat exchanger. I don't have a picture of it on here, do I? Damn. Okay. Well, there will be pictures posted soon. But it's a heat exchanger, and inside this heat sink, it's a cylindrical heat sink, there's a hole that goes and wraps around the inside three times and then comes out the other end. And this is printed in 316L stainless steel. There's no way to manufacture something like that. Yeah, oh, well, it's like having a spiral tube within a solid, a solid metal object. part. So you'd need a or a helical drill. <laughs> yeah, how would you do that? In a circle, like you can't do that. Yeah, that's amazing. But e and and even if it wasn't for for coolant to flow through, you could hollow out a solid metal part like that and just reduce its weight, mm -hmm. or even print it. That's tricky. Printing it with less dense infill is tricky because metal parts tend to be a bit fussy about that they want you to be a hundred percent infill but you can have voids in them as long as they're exposed to the air to to reduce their weight so right. yeah it's pretty again a pretty real like really good example of how 3d printing can change industry and 
again, as, as we've discussed last week with Eric, the, the issue is, is mass production on 3D printing, which, um, yeah, which Quinley aims to solve, which yeah. Quinley does solve, yeah. I should say, so yeah. Yeah, we, we have <laughs> proof and our, our customers are doing high volume on, on our system as well. Um, so speaking of very application specific parts, we should talk about social robotics, which is the uh, super creepy thumbnail that we put on this video. Um, let me just pull up. Which one do you want me to pull up, the MayJ robot? Or um, yeah, I think we could start with the, the Maki actually. Okay, oh, let's do the Maki. Okay, here's the Maki, and here he is. <laughs> yeah. So this is a robot that I got to design at the Social and Intelligent Robotics Research Lab at the University of Waterloo. And that research lab is headed by Professor Tristan Bosenhan, and she is very, very involved with the field of assistive social robotics for children. Especially, and so this robot was designed as a a social robot meant to help students and and other children on the autism spectrum learn social skills. Uh, so it's a really small desktop robot. It can move around on a table, and it's about eleven inches tall. So it's actually very small. Oh, that's and tiny. It's it's really really small. Yeah, a lot of people would think it's it's some really big robot, and and. Mm -hmm. Usually those big robots are, you know, injection molded with plastic and create these shells. But because this is so small, and because this this is a specifically a second prototype design, we use three D printing to actually build everything on the robot that isn't a motor, servo, wire, or sensor. So every single component on this robot was three D printed. Um, so his arms move, um, the eyes blink and move around. The robot can move around on the table. And, you know, it's really designed to have children touch the robot, you know, when the robot deems that it's, it's, the child is able to do so and interact with it. So you can see here in the image where the shoulder uh, region is exposed, sort of flipping through the slideshow. Is it this um, one? Or this? This one. Okay. Yeah. So you can see, you know, one it's really being used for a really long time. On the right hand side, you can see the mechanism is super worn down. Um, the parts need to be replaced. Uh, perhaps something on the robot was changed up and with 3D printing, you're able to replace all of these parts on really specific parts on social robots quickly and easily. And to also create organic geometries, like you see with the Maki robot where you have a very round head very specific internal geometry for the levers that enable the degrees of freedom of the eyes. You can only really do that effectively in a research setting, at least with 3D printing. Um, and even to go into full production of this robot, you would need specific molds for all of these parts. Whereas with 3D printing, you could print whole assemblies of this robot back to back, and you wouldn't have any physical constraints on them, other than having good G-code files. Yeah, that, I, have to say, are really cool, I have to say. I have to say that the actual photo of it is much more pleasant than the render. <laughs> it was very odd to design it, you know, only in CAD, but once it finally became a real robot that, you know, kids could start interacting with, it became a, a very cool, experience to sort of see it from start to finish. And that wouldn't have been possible without 3D printing because this robot went through a lot of revisions mm -hmm. to its parts. And I... to, to revise something this complex with this many parts wouldn't be possible quickly with machining. It'd be super expensive. And no research you know, lab that is really developing a lot of robots at the same time has the funds to put aside just for remaking a part 15 times. Right, right. Yeah, I don't. I can't even imagine how you would make this without tooling up a mold. Well, yeah, for mass production. Yeah, but even even like, how would you do a one-off? I guess you could. No, you'd have to three D print this. There's no other way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you do small batch. You could do a molds. yeah, like a aluminum mold, but that would still run you a few thousand dollars just for the prototype. 
Yeah. Or you, for that one. Mold, then it's easier to use anything. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Shed. I was going to say, even if you were to use the injection mold, it would cost a lot to also apply finishing procedures on those parts. Because these are special robots, they have to be nice and aesthetic. And with 3D printing, you know, as, as long as you've got a good G-code file, you get nice looking parts. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to finish them much or at, at all. These, these blue parts are just printed in blue filament. They're not even painted, are they? No, they're just printed in blue filament. So it gives you a lot of design choices and customization for a robot with really no addition to price. Mm -hmm. What material is this? This whole robot was built of PLA. Yeah, PLA is pretty good stuff. People give it a bad rap, but it takes oh. a lot for it to really be worth moving up in the material. Yeah. I would say so. And there are so many variations too. There are PLA made for motion purposes and higher strength PLAs and higher temp PLAs. There's yeah. a lot out there. I think because a lot of people start with, you know, <laughs> $10 Amazon imported PLA, they, they might get a bad impression of it. But real PLA is, is quite a decent material for most purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really, you know, usable for 3D printing social robots. We even mentioned before that as long as you design a part properly to bear any forces, it can really compete with any of the other manufacturing methods for that part. So if you see on the Maki, the hands and arms are actually completely hollow. It really is just a, it is like a shell for both the hands and the arms. It's about three layers of filament thick. But the whole arm is completely hollow, mm -hmm. and that was achieved by adding a little bit of bracing on the the ends of the arm internally. Um, so we were able to save a ton of filament for those parts. But children still have the ability to hold the maki and play with its arms and move them around. Um, so it was still robust, and its lightweight also allowed the servos that were powering the arms to run effectively and not struggle to lift a really heavy part up and down. And that would have only been possible with with 3D printing in this case, because there's a lot of closed internal geometry that just can't get injection molded. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about the uh, like the eyes and face mechanism? There's a lot going on in there. Like Yeah, so there's some there are some dynamical servos on the back of the head. Uh, That's the dark is moving. The dark yeah, right. the, the darker servos back there and they've got lever arms that you can kind of see curved around the front of the robot and those are all just connected to 3d printed joints that are moving those eyes up and down and side to side that's really cool so so i'm assuming all these parts are 3d printed and so how did how did the joints work are they like snap fit or something they are snap fit in some cases where because this is still a prototype and the parts were being refined we put a small screw through the joint just to hold all of the plastic pieces together. But once we started fine tuning parts, they were able to just snap and force fit together. Uh, and that worked perfectly fine. I will say though, just looking at the head assembly, you can see there are a lot of parts there. And it did take a few weeks to actually get those parts printed at the university's lab. So I can imagine having a technology like Quincy's available for universities would have probably made the process produce all of these parts a lot faster. Yeah, well it's I think it's cool because you're not producing like thousands of these. It's mm -hmm. like if you're if you're trying to create like a batch of twenty or thirty robots, I think Quinlan would be the perfect perfect solution. Well I think even if you're doing a thousand. Or even if you're doing a thousand. I'm because just saying something like this probably isn't just imagine um, the tooling cost. Actually. For, for this many parts, because just looking at these parts, you, you wouldn't be able to put them in like a giant, um, like a sprue cage. I don't, I forgot what the exact term was. Like those, those single sheets that plastic models come in. Oh yeah, you pop them out. Yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to do it with, with these parts because all of these parts would require different um, parting surfaces, which mm -hmm. those types of, uh, like for, for, for large quantities of unique parts, that's that's not possible. So either you're going to have to chop your parts into much more smaller pieces, redesign the parts so that the parting surfaces can line up and so that you can put them in a sheet like that. Um, but what I suspect, if you're trying to make something 
equivalent to this to be injection molded, your, your design would have to be far larger. The robot itself would have to be larger. Yeah. It would have to be larger and have a lot more parts because with 3D printing, we were able to consolidate a lot of parts together to be printed in one piece. Whereas if they were injection molded, you'd, because of the, the complex geometry, you would have had to assemble a lot of parts together to even have a functioning arm. Whereas mm -hmm. with this, the arm is literally one piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be even fair to say that with injection molding, something like this with the complexity would be just infeasible. Yeah, unless you're making, I don't know, the, it would have to be completely redesigned and you'd have to make like a billion of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, Everyone gets a social robot. Yeah, you get well, a social robot. one in seven people would have to have one. No, and that really is the dilemma in social robotics. Um, because, and that's why it hasn't really taken on very much in, in general society. Because a lot of these robots have to have such a nice finish. And it costs a lot of money to injection mold all of the outer pieces. Mm -hmm. So it ends up happening, and it takes a long time too to get the tooling for everything. So what happens is a lot fewer models are available. And even then, they cost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to have one. Um, 3D printing at scale would have, would probably help make social robots a lot more accessible to actually produce and introduce into society. I think it would also help just further the concept of social robots in, in the sense that with 3D printing, because every part you do can be completely unique. You could have a, a system where the actual design of the robot, you know, was was automatically varied and that every single robot produced could be unique. Yeah, imagine if it was like like Mr. Potato Head style where every different nose or mouth or eye or ear could be like different. So you don't have just like a swarm of robots that are all the same. You could just have like yeah, a nice clones. <laughs> like diverse group of different looking robots that are pleasant to deal with. Yeah, and, the, and not scary. <laughs> and it would it would be I, I guess Mr. Potato Head is, is a good example of how you can try to solve that with on a mass scale, because mm -hmm. Mr. Potato Heads are mass produced and they have to have modular parts. Like yeah. even though you can combine them in different ways, the ears are always identical to one another. And the eyes are always, you always have the same set of eyes that you can apply. And your design has to accommodate that. And you have to spend a lot of extra time designing so that all of these different modules can fit together. Whereas with something like 3D printing, it'd be like a Mr. Potato Head, but where every single feature is continuous between... You have a scaling nose factor yeah. and like an eye shape. You could Morgan literally <laughs> go on, on, you know, who makes it? Hasbro or Mattel? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, you could, you could go on their website, specify the exact dimensions of the nose that you want, mm -hmm. and have one produced exactly how you want, and it's not going to cost them anymore. Yeah, it looks like those character creation. You <laughs> play the video game. Yeah, you yeah. choose your character. You yeah. Choose lighters, yeah. And you get your own custom... Uh, social robot yeah i bet that would that would do wonders for that that concept yeah, that's what we actually did with my j uh, which okay. is the second robot i got to work with and it was in that's going to a thesis project for one of the grad students at the lab in Tanga, and i got to work on this robot with him and the whole idea of my j is that it's this mobile robot that plays on a field and so the, the whole point is to get children with varying levels of um, motor abilities, bodily motor abilities, to play the same physical game together. And so they use the robot as props. And if you've seen the picture, the ears and the glasses on Maki were 3D printed. And kids could have the ability to customize their robot using these 3D printed accessories, oh, so cool. much like Mr. Potato. So it's even funny that you mentioned that. And we got a lot of really creative mechanisms for the MyJ robot because of 3D printing a lot of the components here. That's pretty cool. Is, is, the, um, is that front roller um, like the main driving wheel? Yeah, so that front roller is the intake. And a lot of times intakes in robotics will have a large axle and they'll have roller wheels or compliant wheels um, compressing what they're trying to intake in. 
But what we actually did is we created a thread profile along this large roller wheel for our axle, and we threw in polycord tubing made of like a rubbery silicone. And that was a much safer mechanism that was still able to intake the ball, um, which was the game piece for this specific robot. And the screw pattern also allowed the ball to move towards the center of the robot as they were being taken in, which also allowed for really automatic alignment into the next mechanism that would then bring the ball up to the shooter. And so, you know, like we were talking with assembly lines where we have to press the product to be, you know, moved around by the automation. The 3D printing here was utilized in a way where it was built in to move the part closer to the center of the robot for the next mechanism mm -hmm. to take hold of it. Yeah, it's, it's the, the automation tool itself is preparing the materials. It's, it's completely internal, which I, I think is excellent. Like, I, I think that's how it should be. You shouldn't have to... Well, you always, to some extent, have to accommodate it, but it should be as, as self-contained as possible, especially if, if we want to see automation on a mass scale. It, it has to be self-contained, and it has to be customizable, and it has to be generalizable as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a brilliant application of, of exactly that idea. I think it should be said that the... Uh... Like 3D printing allows you to get these really cool contoured aesthetics. And I, I actually don't know, is this supposed to be um, like an animal? Is this based around an animal? Or no, is we designed completely... it to be relatively anamorphic. We wanted it okay. to be a very general four-legged animal shape so that when kids are playing with it, they can really imagine what it could be like. We've gotten that it looked like a hippo, a dog, a rabbit even, because it's got a little cute tail at the end. Yeah. But all of those exterior shell components were designed in CAD and were fully 3D printed. And it would have been really difficult to print a prototype this nice um, without having 3D printing. If we had, would have had to go and injection mold something. We're talking final robot part, not even prototyping. And on top of that, because we 3D printed it, we could take advantage of different filaments. So the main body here is white. But the bottom of the robot, you can see, is with a clear PLA. And what that enabled us to do was install lights into the bottom of the robot so that when it's moving around, the light changes and the patterns change to allow those students and, and children to see what the robot was doing on the field. Which usually, when you have children with motor special needs like cerebral palsy, it also comes sometimes with some learning special needs. So having that flexibility to design a shell in multiple in multiple materials at a unit of one with 3D printing was really special to see a, a relatively finished product for just a prototype. Yeah. He, he made me imagine, like, you know those really high-end cars with the underglow? Like, <laughs> tiny, like <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining a souped up, like, one of these just I wonder speeding if away. Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get some, get it lifted too. Hydraulic yeah. lift. <laughs> There's a lot of possibilities here. These are I think awesome. it looks more like a hippo than anything, but... From the back, it kind of looks like an elephant. Yeah, I, I really do like this idea of, um, what's it called, an anamorphic shape? Because it, mm -hmm. it doesn't clearly resemble anything, but... But it's a friendly it shape. It lets your imagination kind of yeah. run wild a little bit. Yeah. It's a really, yeah. really good design. We created round ears and sort of triangle more cat-like ears. We even created dinosaur. Um, Sort of, sort of like crest additions to add onto the robot so kids could customize and, and make it whatever they'd like it to be. All at a volume of one. Yeah. Or, of a, or a hundred <laughs> or however many they would need. That's, yeah. That is so cool. Um, oh, there's another set of slides. Oh, these are the, all the references. Let me center them so that we can see. Can we pause the video and check them out? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because this, there was a paper written about these. Yeah, we because it was such a long project, we were actually able to publish three papers about the design development of MyJ. So if anyone is interested, you can go look at those three papers. Uh, it was a really fun experience to design such a modular, fun robot. Yeah.
that's yeah that's brilliant that's an amazing application of 3d printing and again being able to do such unique things at such low volumes is is awesome and then the best part of it is if you have something like quinley there's no problem scaling it up mm -hmm. like if you once you've got your design or it's it's not even the final design or the final parts once you've got your design concept you can go ahead and and make you know 10 that look like this 10 that look like this as long yeah. as the you know you know that the parts will fit together at the end or all just subtly different mm -hmm. you do your sliders yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder. Really cool, what's really cool too about my day is that it was designed to be open source. So the fact that all of these parts are 3D printable really just enables anyone to go ahead and build a live jet if they want. Um, so I think that aspect of developing a social robot that anyone could take the design for and make is really cool. And it's really only possible in general if you have 3D printing because the average person doesn't have access to injection molding or Mm -hmm. Yeah, and exactly. The barrier to entry is so, so low with 3D printing, which is awesome. I mean, we're seeing with some of our customers, they're, they're doing thousands of parts a month out of their garage studio. Yeah. And thousands of parts a month is, is like what some injection molding jobs are doing. So they're, mm -hmm. they're overlapping with injection molding. They're actually one of our customers. He recently told me, he was running at a rate of 56,000 parts per year. Ooh, yeah. that's pretty cool. I, guess how many printers he was running? Oh, man. Three? Yeah, three Quinleys. Hey, hey, that's pretty good. They were, they were small parts, but that's insane. Like, that's how low the barrier to entry for mass manufacturing is. If, if you come up with an idea that either uses a lot of unique parts or um, just starts taking off, you, you can retain complete control over your production and, and start scaling it up. Um, that applies to individuals, but it also applies to businesses of all kinds. On the upper end, it, 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 a lot of businesses would prefer to retain control over their production because um, outsourcing production is only, is, is most cost effective when you do it overseas and then that creates long distended supply chains and if you want to hear more about that you should definitely watch the previous stream with with eric woolridge where we go pretty in depth into that but just having the capacity to run like full-scale production without any sort of special facility is is i think it's going to be a real game changer for for robotics and for automation applications in general yeah definitely I think we've got one more, uh, one more topic we were wanting to cover. This yes. is a really cool one. Uh, this is going back to custom effectors. Yeah. So, you know, earlier we were talking about all the robots being hard, rigid, mechanical kind of constructions. Well, now um, an emerging field is the study of, of soft robotics and using like elastomeric, bendy materials to create. Um, like motion, um, and now, now we're starting to see three D printing becoming um, used quite a lot in not just the prototype but manufacturing of uh, these soft robotics uh, devices. Yeah, in fact, three D printing is the only way you can make a lot of these mechanisms because you have the ability of creating parts that have complex voids, or in this case air pockets that you can uh, run with using air pressure. Yeah, these are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and these, the some current parts manufacturing parts. method for a lot of these actuators and, and soft robotics bodies is using your polyurethanes and the silicones that you pour into some mold that you have to have ready and created. And then usually cured by either heating it up or exposing it to UV. Um, but even then, you're limited by the geometry that a mold could potentially produce. And you still have to have a mold to actually get a part, even though that it, it only takes you know, 15, 20 minutes to bake. 
there's still limitations. And it'd be really interesting to see how soft robotics further takes 3D printing to create all of these really interesting soft actuators. I know they're, they're starting to use 3D printing now. Um, very limited though, because it's, it's still an emerging field. But it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how 3D printing could revolutionize the manufacturing process and creation process for all, for all of these products. Yeah, well, one of the things recently is um, the introduction of very, very soft um, like thermoplastic. Like if you've used TPU before, the stuff you can get normally is quite rigid still. It keeps its shape. But there are some that just that you can just crumple up completely. They just super squish. And this is the like durometer sixty eight mm -hmm. stuff, um, which is just very soft and it's almost um, it's super hard to print. So that's kind of why it's hard to get into. Um, but if you can figure out the, the print settings for this stuff, um, I think it'll open up a lot of doors for um, some soft robotics. It was actually one of the projects I was working on last year. Um, I created a three material 3D printer that was designed to print soft robotics. So it could print that really um, flexible 60A durometer uh, TPU on top of something like PLA that for parts that don't need um, the flexibility. So you could combine flexible parts with rigid sort of exoskeletons to create like a composite, composite soft robotic uh, device, which is probably even more difficult to manufacture in a traditional way. I think I, I think that's so cool. It's 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 that idea that uh, at some point all the mechanisms we're designing start to imitate biology because now you're printing soft robots with bones in them. Yeah. Because you have rigid components and soft components that actuate. That that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that the, the the human body is like the best. Yeah, it turns out billions of years of evolution uh, came up with some pretty good designs. Self-healing robot. Yeah. <laughs> lasts for hundreds of years. Tens of years. Tens of years. Maybe hundreds in, in, in the near future. <laughs> yeah, when we're all living in computers. I just pulled a number. Right? <laughs> yeah, hundreds of years. I wish. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't I'm know. very optimistic. So. Yeah. Um, I think also one of the one of the biggest limitations that you were saying of the soft robotics field is the difficulty to mass produce because there's there relies so much on 3D printing and I, I think that's where something like Quinley is going to be really really beneficial because you will be able to mass produce these now because it, it will scale the 3D printing you've already been doing to produce these designs um, to a level of, of tens of thousands of parts. Yeah like it, it must be very nice in a research research setting having your 3D printed prototypes, just improving them slowly. And you don't have to change everything to mass produce them. You just use the same design, you use the same file, and then you just pop them on a Quinley and then just bang them out. Yeah, I think, I think it will help that because I do see a lot of really cool research papers and then we never see them used in industry like it, it or it takes ages like there's that you know that blue soft robotics gripper that's pretty standard in the robotics industry like the triple octopus arm yeah i think it's either got three or eight and it like it took years to actually commercialize that mm -hmm. from when it was first designed um and conceived because it's it's still pretty difficult to manufacture. Their their design is is good. It, I think it gets molded, um, but there also aren't that many variations available. The only variations you really get are in the number of um, fingers mm -hmm. and like the size of the fingers and and the angle and and how they actuate. Um, but if you could change the shape of the fingers substantially or even introduce like additional air pockets that maybe make the fingers grab and then twist or grab in a certain way um, or have you know two fingers actuate in a particular way and the other ones actuate in another way unique to a specific part that it's picking up um, like there, there's so much benefit to that but you can't really do that when you're when you're molding these and I think that's 
why we've seen um, such a limited selection of actual soft robotics that are made for industry. Yeah, and I think later on we'll see like robotics in general, general becoming more intelligent. Like I, I say intelligent, like having four sensors on the fingers, for example, to determine if you've actually picked up an object or not, like having feedback. And, you know, it, being able to 3D print something gives you that design freedom to have sort of like embedded, or like, not embedded, but like wires kind of going through your part that, that doesn't require having like a really complicated molding pl uh, process. Mm -hmm. Those internal voids again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I hope that with Quinley and with 3D printing automation, we will start seeing a lot of these really creative designs um, moving into mainstream robotics and, and actual commercial applications. Because yeah. I do remember, <laughs> it wasn't even that long ago, I went to a, a 3D printing, I went to an automation trade show in Anaheim in February, and we were watching like the state of the art uh, robotic grabber that was picking up, it was like a selection of maybe 10 different objects and, and they'd cycle through and they'd kind of be in a random position. And it was failing to pick them up 30% of the time because um, the software was really intelligent, but the design of the gripper was just so limiting that it couldn't really adapt to the different parts. And you could tell that um, like the, the selection of parts was good. They had like a ball, a box, um, a cylinder, um, a, like a piece of PVC pipe. Um, and, but you could kind of tell that all the parts had a similar diameter and the, the robot had to position itself to best grab it as possible. And you could see that this amazing software they built was completely being restricted and bottlenecked by the fact that the gripper was not a very smart or flexible system. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think if they could have, I know that's supposed to be a general robot, but I think if they could have um, a gripper that was more adaptable and had more actuation modes, like finger, like real fingers, yeah. um, it would have been far more successful, especially coupled with the amazing software that they had already. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, the nice thing about soft actuators is you can get complicated like non-linear gripping patterns because they just deform to close around the shape that you're trying to grab. Yeah, you can, you can literally program it into the shape of the material how you want it to actuate. Which yeah, is that's what soft robotics tries to achieve is this embodied intelligence mm -hmm. or the, this ability to have a lot of variation of movement within the body itself without relying completely on the software but also without inhibiting the software. And almost intrinsically with that goal that they have, they're currently limiting their embodied intelligence by roles mm -hmm. uh, used to build all of these forms. So 3D printing will hopefully evolve enough to allow them full range of design. Yeah, I think so. I think the ability of, to design the inside and the outside of your part is, is what's going to get it there. And um, I mean, it's already been demonstrated that you can do that. It just, now it needs a path to scaling, which is what we do here, <laughs> is, is give them that path to, to scale those brilliant designs. Um, just checking chat, if there's any questions. Big black mirror moment. Hmm. That's a good point. Maybe we shouldn't uh, be advancing automation. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's go back. Should we go back to Let's make 3D printers more intensely manual. Yeah. You have to push the filament. There's no extruder. I used to do that. Yeah. I, <laughs> that I too. In high school, I didn't know how to do like bed leveling, so my first layer was super like thin and it wouldn't extrude properly, so I just pushed the filament for the first for layer. For the first layer, I've done that too before. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I did it because, yeah, anyway, <laughs> that was, yeah, that, that brought back, that opened some scars that had healed. 
Or does your defense it could just be like Netflix? Are you still there? <laughs> yeah. Maybe just click every, every oh, every two minutes? Yeah. Oh, we should implement that. And then make you... sure you don't, you know, stop watching it. April Fool's update. <laughs> oh, he was saying it was about living in computers. Who's to say the universe isn't a giant computer? Oh. Yeah, Quinley is the name of the person inside the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doing all the... the there is actually yeah, a, a sentient operator in each Pi. Yeah. That's how it works so well. Um, I think that's the end of our... What we had planned. Of what we had planned. So, happy to take any questions. We should, I guess we could also leak a special announcement for those of you who have uh, stuck around to the end. Um, make sure to smash that like button. We forgot to say that yeah, earlier. Smash the like button. Smash the like button. Hit the bell. We haven't said that one yet. Yeah, hit the bell. You'll, Does that uh, still exist on YouTube? Pretty sure. Yeah. I click the bell. Okay. Bell. Ding the bell. Yeah, because it lets you know when we're, when we're live. So. Yes. If you ever uh, tend to miss our streams, or wake up halfway through our streams, then uh, wow, yeah, you can help out. That's super pointed. Oh, he knows who he is. <laughs> yeah. Jack knows who he is. Jack knows who he is. <laughs> um, yeah. So for those of you who stuck around to the end, uh, we've been doing something very exciting on Quinley recently, and there's going to be an announcement soon. Um, I don't have any pictures yet, but there will be pictures in the announcement. Or I don't, I don't have pictures on the stream, but um, we've been working on printing medals with Quinley. I think I mentioned it earlier, actually. Well, now we're saying it for real. Now we're saying it for real. <laughs> the real announcement. Yeah, we're, we're printing, we've been experimenting with metal FDM on Quinley, and, and we've been able to get some really, really good results on machines that don't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but things like the the Ultimaker S5, and we've even managed to replicate things like um, breakaway supports and uh, Sintrable support material. So, yeah, look out for that because that's going to be, I think, a pretty big game changer. We've already seen everyone scaling. They're printing on Quinley and with plastics, and now you'll have the option to do it with metals and um, also benefit from the the, the price uh, improvement that comes from metal FDM. So that's super exciting. Yeah. Very cool work. Shahed's, Shahed's also uh, involved with some of the um, like the costing and analysis and proving that yeah, Quinley's actually significantly cheaper than other options for this stuff makes it viable for mass production yeah. definitely um when yeah, comes the bottleneck really is old metal 3d printing it's slow and with quinley he's like it's slow but highly scalable yes so, um <laughs> actually yeah there's a problem that's been solved yeah i think the current uh strategy of just buying larger metal machines is n not scalable infinitely I think, yeah, you can print, you know, a thousand objects in your print bed, but you still have to remove those thousand objects. Whereas with Quinley's, there's none of that removal or cleanup, and it is far slower, but the cost is lower to the point where um, you can just have more machines and still be saving on your part cost, still have a very, very competitive part cost. Um, yeah, I don't know how much more we want to say about that. Yeah, very I think little part cost. There will probably be a stream about it yeah, coming up. Stream. Yeah, yeah, and show the parts. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for sticking around. Uh, it's always worth it to stick around at the end. Yeah. <laughs> the secret <laughs> announcement time. Taylor just spills the beans. Spill all beans. <laughs> beans are everywhere. Pobago potato. A word from our, a, fi a closing <laughs> words from our CEO. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. <laughs> All right, yeah. So, in summary, 
maybe to do a wrap up for anyone who's who's just joining at the end. Um, but we've got Shahed, who's been highly involved with robotics competitions, who's also been um, a hardware design intern with us for the last few months. And um, we've been talking about the application of 3D printing in FIRST Robotics, her initiative to, um, well, the benefits of using 3D printing for these competitions specifically, and then her initiative to set up a 3D printing service center at the actual competition so that people can, re can print replacement parts. Um, because sometimes parts break yeah. and being able to immediately print them on competition on demand would be really, really great for the teams, especially those who lack the resources to fly out 3D printers or drive to a printing service bureau. Um, we also spoke about how just how 3D printing enables really, really creative robotics design, how it saves weight and therefore um, improves speed or improves battery life and how that can extend to other industries as well, like electric cars or just automotive in general. Um, things like industrial automation where you want your robotic arms or, or automated systems to move as fast as possible. Um, dispelling the myth that a 3D printed part can't be as strong as other types of manufacturing because it doesn't factor in the idea that 3D prints can be designed in a different way, in a much more efficient way. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about um, adaptive printing and um, purpose specific printing, which, which is very important in, in automation because you want your automated system to be able to handle what's being given to it. You don't want to have a lot of pre-processed steps that prepare your, your parts for a drop-in system, which is how most automated systems and, and robotic systems work now. They tend to have a universal robotics design um, that you have to fit into your application. Um, which is, it's better than nothing, but if you had a purpose-built robot, um, it would work much better. And speaking of purpose-built robots, we looked at Shahed's Maki robot design, um, which leverages 3D printing to make dozens of extremely unique and or parts that have to fit within a tiny organic chassis. Um, like this is just brilliant. There's n there's no way you could manufacture this without three D printing. Um, and it should be said this is a social robot. Yes. Um, to be used for like interacting with with, with children. Yeah, and and so she was able to design um, like a very pleasantly shaped robot, which would be very hard to manufacture with molds, mm -hmm. and and also make all the mechanisms within it conform to those crazy organic contours. And another example of that is the Meiji project, which is also super cool. Another, another example of social robotics um, where you want to have an outwardly friendly chassis and hide all the scary mechanical stuff <laughs> inside. I think the scary mechanical stuff is cool. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I know it's not the most uh, aesthetically pleasing to some people. Yeah, this definitely looks much more friendly than this. Yeah. <laughs> and we were talking about the possibilities of having um, like customizable designs for these robots too. So instead of having them all look the same, with 3D printing you can have them all slightly different. And um, with things like generative design, you're allowed to have sort of like sliders so you can kind of customize different shapes, different parts of the machine that don't have any functional purpose, just to give them that aesthetic um, difference that makes them sort of feel more realistic to the people who use them. Yeah, because whether we like it or not, we're going to work alongside machines more and more in the future, so yeah. we should make them look as nice as possible, I think. Yeah. Um, and 
yeah, we also talked about soft robotics, which you often see papers on, um, but are actually pretty infeasible to manufacture with current mass production techniques and, and how Quinley um, can help scale the 3D printing they already use to design these to a point where they can actually be used in high volumes for industrial applications. Mix that in with a generative design and you can have purpose-built 3D printed soft robotics on a mass scale and yeah, automation will just, current automation tech will, I think, kind of get blown out of the water with that. Get ready, Quinley's coming. Get ready. <laughs> yeah. I think that's everything. That's about it. That's All it. Have fun. Thanks so much, Shahad. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. It was, it was a great discussion. Very exciting. Yeah. I'm super excited to see how 3D printer automation can help other automation. And it was good to see um, some of the people from the robotics teams in the chat too. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learned something new. Yeah. And also, yeah, let us know on, on Discord and we continue some conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Join our Discord and yeah, we'll keep talking there. All right. I guess we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.